Who, through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Now this to me is marvelous because here's Jesus shed his blood. He did all he could do for one reason, so he could purge our consciences from dead works to serve the living God. And so what I get out of this is we are saved to serve. Do you get that from here? I do. And not only are we saved from life itself, which indeed our lives are spared many more times than we really realize it, I think, but we are saved from dead works. That means coming to church and sitting in the pews and not really feeling the influence of the Holy Spirit and Jesus talking to your heart and then going home and just doing what we did all week and not growing with Jesus. If we're not moving forward with Jesus, guess what? We're going backwards. I don't want to go backwards. I don't want to, but it takes a daily and hourly and a moment by moment connection with Jesus. And then he will purge us from dead works to serve the living God. Now, I've been in Thailand for nine years total and in Biota for eight. And uh, in that time period, I can list a few things on my two hands that I know God saved my life. And so quickly, to tell you about those times, the first time was when I first got there. Praise the Lord that I knew for sure it was God's will for me to go because I might have turned tail and run. So before you up and do some big calling, make sure it's from God. Make sure it's the way, the place, the time, everything from God and then go boldly forward because he is with you. And then when trouble hits, whether you live or whether you die, it's okay with you. Because if you die, it's not the worst thing in the world at all. Because if you're in God's hands doing God's will, your death means that you can bring more souls to heaven to God by your death than by your life. So to me, it's all okay. That is wonderful. So with that uh, viewpoint, I'm in um, uh, Mesalit. I've just arrived, haven't been there too long, to the school because I'm relieving these missionaries for three months. I have a round trip ticket, me and my boys. And so when I get there, it's a little different than I thought. First of all, it's not so primitive. There's a main road right through there. But second of all, it's closer to Burma than I thought. And the boys and I, we already kind of thought that it's a little dangerous because the school just had to be evacuated because the Burmese army came in and, uh, and they had to flee the school and they had to relocate on the Thai side. So they've been through real trauma. And a little history of the Karen people, I'm just going to put this in, is they have been tortured by the Burmese army for 65 years. And they are a forgotten, traumatized group of people. The Burmese army has two groups. They're stronger than the Karen army. There are many Karen. They're born and brought up in Karen state, right there in Burma. But the Burmese hate them. At one time, they said, in 10 years, all the Karen will be dead, right? And but it didn't happen, but they still. And there's a rule for peace between the government and the Karen. But out in the jungle, they don't care. They still fight. People have fled from their homes and seen their homes get burned up uh, six or seven times. Children have watched their parents get tortured and killed. And it's not an easy country. It's nothing like America. We don't even know suffering to that degree. So therefore, in the whole 65 years of turmoil over there against the Koran, they have fled to different countries. They have fled into Thailand. And consequently, I'm there in the jungle, deep in the jungle in the center of Thailand, with Koran people, living in little villages like they lived 100 years ago in Burma, but peaceably because now if you're born in Thailand, you can be a citizen there. So that's an improvement. But through the years, that's what made me fall in love with the Koran people because they are forgotten. They're traumatized. There is no group of people, I think, in my humble estimation, that will enjoy the freedom and love of heaven more than the Koran people because they will then finally have a home where they belong. Otherwise, 
they don't belong anywhere. The Thai people try to push them back into Burma. They would get killed if they went there. So nobody really wants them. When they go to a foreign country, they really can't adapt to the culture of America or Denmark or Australia or other countries. So they have had a really rough time. But through, th through the years, I have noticed that God protects me when my life is threatened. I know I don't know all the times, but one is uh, at that mission home when I first came to Thailand on the front porch. Now that you know the history of the um, Burmese army, the second Burmese army at the time that was very vicious was uh, called DKGB, D DKGB army. And they were ruthless, scrupulous. They were horrible. And they kept coming across the river and killing Karen people here and there along the border where we were. And so one night I'm sleeping on the front porch of that house. And uh, in the middle of the night, I woke up to a lot of noise of dogs being really angry and then noises around me and soldiers come up on the porch. And at least one. I saw one because it was in the middle of the night and I saw his silhouette come up and then go down and I'm sharing the porch with an enemy. Now this is my very first, oh, few weeks in Thailand. And now I think I'm gonna get killed. I will get killed because they hate anybody to help the Koran and I'm kind of there as the figure in charge of this school at the time. And so I'm laying there with my head towards the wall of the house and all the outside is behind me and I'm scared to move. I'm stiff as a board, I'm very scared. And I'm thinking a bullet is gonna go right through me any time because my white hair is glowing, I'm sure. <laughs> and, and so as I'm laying there frozen in fear, I said to the Lord, oh Lord, perfect love casts out fear. And suddenly the thought came to me, well God sent you here. So why are you so scared? So I calm down, but there's still somebody there on the porch. But I'm calm and I wait. It seems like 20 minutes, but it might have been 15 seconds. But then a really bright light, like brighter than that, from like a, a tractor trailer truck of light, it came on behind me, right behind my head and hit the wall on the porch. So now I think a bullet's gonna come. They see my head right there, my gray ponytail hanging out. And I think, okay, anytime I say, I'm frozen again, I'm scared. And I go, oh, Lord, help me. Please calm me because whatever's going to happen is going to happen. So I lay there and I got peace again and calm. And then I laid there for a while. I really didn't mean to go into this story. But um, I had to go to the bathroom and I thought, well, you know what? They've already seen me perfectly. So they know I'm here. They can shoot me whether I'm laying down or standing up. So I'm going to the bathroom. <laughs> so I went to the bathroom. And when I came back, it's a little bit brave, and I shone my little, my little tiny typhoon flashlight. I didn't see anything, nothing. Now, the next day, I was going to introduce Jesus to the students' parents. They were all coming, and I was going to tell them about Jesus and why we have the rules we have that are so different at that school. So it was a wonderful thing, and I, when I went to sleep, I went to sleep thinking, uh, trying to prepare what I would say, but I was unable to think. I went to sleep on my Bible. So now that I recover myself, I'm going back to bed. I see my Bible, and it's open. And it's open to Psalm 118, verse 17. I shall not die, but live and proclaim the glory of the Lord. Amen. And you know, I introduced Jesus to those parents that day. It was a beautiful thing. And it taught me a lot about fear. And it taught me a lot about death. Because, you know, we're not supposed to be scared of these things. So... The next thing that I remember that I might have died from was when I got a tropical disease. I had been so healthy, not a sore throat, no diarrhea, not a cough, not a runny nose, nothing. And so when we walked into Biota, or we had to walk seven and a half hours in rainy season to walk into Biota, and when I got there, usually I just cook the rice right away because I'm starving hungry, but this time, I said to Bledja, you have to read my history because I can't tell you all my stories right now. I wish I could. But when I got there, I said to Bledja, is it cold out here? He said a little bit. And I thought, okay, good, because I'm sure I'm not sick, but my hands are a little numb. And then later I started getting a fever and I thought, Shh, I'm not sick. I've never been sick. I'm fine. And then I went to bed. It was 104.8. 
and I thought something is wrong with me. Well, I'm the nurse, and I'm the only medical person out there, so I'm supposed to know what to do and what I have, and so I do know, I think. And I said, I've got dinky fever, and dinky fever comes from a mosquito, and it's a virus. So even if you go to the hospital, they can't do anything. Now, in four days, you could hemorrhage. That's a um, complication. But uh, then I might need medical help, but I don't think that would happen. But I had all the signs and symptoms of dinky fever. First, arms and legs really hurt, stomach hurt, very painful, fever very high, and you feel like you're going to die. And I had all those symptoms. In fact, I felt like I was going to die, but then I was afraid I wouldn't. So, <laughs> Bledjaw keeps telling me, Gail, shouldn't you go to the doctor? Shouldn't you go to the hospital? I said, Bledjaw, I can't climb this mountain. I can't go in this rain to see the doctor, so I wait. Well, Sabbath comes along. That's the third day. I've just laid there. And then um, that night, Saturday night, it rained a lot. It didn't just rain like torrents of rain. It was like an Olympic-sized swimming pool opened out on our house all night long. In the morning, Bledjaw says to me, Gail, won't you go to the hospital? I said, why, no, did you hear all that rain last night? I could never make it, no. And then he left and immediately I heard God's voice saying to me, clearer than I've ever heard it before, Gail, you're being stubborn. And I said, oh Lord, I am being stubborn because Bledjaw always gives me good advice and I'm not listening to him. Oh Lord, I'm sorry. But then I say, do you really want me to go? You're just going to have to help me because I can't do it. Just then, bad music started up in that school right next door to us. The teacher was leaving. They were having a party. And it's such wicked, loud. They play it so loud. We usually have to leave until that's over with. So now I know for sure. This is God sending me out of here, so I go. And in going, I, get, uh, I have to be on the motorcycle in the rain, and Bledjaw gets another young man to take me because his legs are longer. He thinks he can probably hold the bike up better, and um, we have chain on the back wheel. That always makes a big difference. And I have my raincoat on. I'm sitting there on the back of the bike, and we have to go up. Well, we wreck three times, and the first time we wreck, the chain breaks off the back wheel. And I say, great. That's the only way we're going to make it out of here. Then the second time, we wreck. Then the third time, we really wreck because we're in the steepest part. We think we're going to make it, but we go off the little lump and we go into the rut and we hit a rock and I flip. That's the second time. I flip totally head over heels off the bike and I'm laying on the mud on my back, unable to move. And then the guy, he's strong, but it's very steep and it's very slippery and the bike is kind of heavy and he can't hold it up and the bike is coming down, down, down. And it comes on my stomach and the back wheel's going round and round and round on my stomach and my raincoat comes off and my clothes are torn. And just then, Bledjaw's walking in and he meets us and he sees this happening and he looks horrified and I'm not hurt. And uh, we continue our journey. To tell you the truth, I don't remember the rest of that journey, but I... I do know one thing, and I didn't think of it until weeks later, maybe even a year later. What if the chain had not broken off the back of that motorbike? How would my stomach be handling that with that thing spinning quickly around on my stomach? So God never leaves us or forsakes us. In our hardest moments, his hand, he's with every single situation. So we went to the hospital. I had a malaria test. I had dinky fever test, and I knew... I got dinky fever, and it came back negative, both of them. I didn't have dinky fever. And so I had scrub typhus, and scrub typhus comes from a little mite or a flea off a rat in the deeper uh, jungle, not around villages, but we walk a lot through the jungle. And so uh, if you get bitten by an infected flea off of that, of a rat, you get scrub typhus. Now scrub typhus is really dangerous. If you, the treatment is simple. But if you don't get the treatment, you can die easily within one week. And after I knew my diagnosis, I already found out, somebody told me, uh, somebody dying in a larger hospital right then with respiratory uh, depression, um, kidney failure, his body shutting down. And he did die. And, uh, but I got my medicine on the fourth day. I recovered. In 10 days, I was back at work. So thank you, Lord. I am saved to serve. Okay, so those are two things. The other two uh, are simple things that uh, 
can get you killed quickly. One is uh, the truck, because we had a sudden rain one time, and we are um, going into BO2 with Bibles and with medicine, and we're all excited, and we're going in, and it's not rainy season, but suddenly there's a thunderstorm, and there's a loud <laughs> clap of thunder on the left, and oh, it's raining over here, and then we look, oh, it's raining over here, and we're halfway to Biota. But then it just like the sky opens up and it pours, and we think, we better turn around and go back, because if we go forward, it's suicide, it's even worse. So we better make our way out, but it's hard. And so we got out, and we're on this cement part of the road, almost out of the big mountain, and as we go around one corner, the dirt bank has been um, washed down on the road. Now, red... Uh, white mud is not too slippery, and black, dark dirt is not too slippery, but a little more, and red mud is horrible. This is red mud, and we go slowly around, and Bledja is driving, and as we round that corner, we go into a skid. We hit that stuff slicker than ice, and you know, when you're in a, a skid, velocity just picks up. It just propels you faster than you ever wanted to go, and we're going straight to the cliff. And we looked at it lately. We went with you to look. It's really steep. And off this side of that is the steepest, straightest down cliff that really that I probably know out there. And so we were in a skid going straight for the cliff. There is no way that we're going to keep from going over that cliff. But just as the back wheel was on the edge, the soft part right before the cliff, that truck stopped. At an angle, tilted toward the cliff, it stopped right there. We struggled for about two hours to get out of that situation by ourselves on the side of that mountain, but we got out, and my life was saved to serve. Um, two other times, we meet the wild elephant face to face, and if you want to hear what I think of wild elephants in my area, you got to go to my webpage. My card is on that desk, and you can read all about it because it's horrifying. But we met that guy, and there's some are worse than others, but they they want to kill. They charge to kill, and there's no isolation. There's no fence. There's no moat. It's free range for the wild elephants. Twice we met the wild elephant face to face, and our angel tranquilized those beasts. He shut the mouths of the lions. He can also take care of the elephants. He's way bigger than that. And the other time was what I told you yesterday, the cobra, which was, was really, really offended at us coming into his territory right upon his head right there. So, and you know, when we get to heaven, you and I, all of us, we're going to find out from our angels what other things we were saved from. We've been saved so many times. Why are we not bursting with gratitude to God for that? So, um, I want to read something. One soul saved in the kingdom of God is of more value than all earthly riches. It is high time we were now in earnest to redeem the time, lest the blood of souls be found on our garments. You know, we're, this is really serious. We've got to really realize we can't fool around nowadays. Jesus is about to come, and we know so much even the dumbest of us or the youngest of us, we know way more than so many people in the world. And I can tell you more than my people in my area of the world. And I don't want blood on my garments or yours either, either one. So Gospel Worker says there's a great work to be done in a very short time. While many are getting ready to do something, souls will perish for lack of light and knowledge. What if it's your soul? What if it's your child's soul? What if it's uh, somebody you really care about? Well, guess what? Everyone in this world we need to really care about because you never know who's really in need or not. And as we work with God, he lets us know. Now, I want to, you to meet this little lady. I don't know her name. But we met this little lady in Nelligui Village, one of the villages, and we just happened to see her she lives in a little um, metal square about the size of an outhouse building, and the metal's been tied together, and uh, it has a bamboo floor, and you can't really cook there because it, the pot would fall right through. Her house is falling apart. And so when we went and met this lady, we asked the usual question, how old are you? 
because Korean people always they ask that and it's not doesn't matter if you're old or not we're not offended at that that's how come I don't care you ask me and this lady she says I'm 200 years old <laughs> Because Korean people don't know how old they are. Most people in my villages, they don't know even when their children were born. They don't know how old they are. So she says 200, and she's really, I guess, joking. But she says, you know, I really don't know why I'm still around. And so we wanted to make friends with this dear lady because, you know, we need to work with souls that are old because they don't have too long to live to hear the gospel. So we need to work with the old. And so as we talk to this lady and others around, through the weeks, we discover her history. Her history is this. As a young girl, she got pregnant out of wedlock and had a baby. Now, in the Korean culture, as it should be everywhere in the world, that is frowned upon. And so the villagers shamed her. It, they work with the system of honor and shame. And they shamed her to such a degree that she felt so bad that she killed her baby. And then later, she got married. And when she got married, she was married a long time, and she wanted to have children, but she could not. And all the village people said to her, no child wants to grow inside of your stomach because you're going to kill it. And so they blamed her and her uh, sin from the past for the rest of her life. Her husband died. Now she is old. She has no family. She's in a village where everybody hates her. And they will bring her rice, but they don't want to. And there she is alone, and she will die soon. So we brought her the message of Jesus. She had good mentality. And so simply we told her, you know, there is one person that doesn't blame you for what you've done. It doesn't hold it against you, but he loves you. And he will forgive you if you ask him, and it'll be finished. And you can have peace in your heart. And this Jesus that loves you, he's coming again. And you don't have to just die of old age here, having a miserable time. You have something to look forward to. Would you like that? She said, yes, she would like that. So you never know what poor dear soul you can save for heaven. Now besides the old people, there's the young people. And we need to really work for the salvation of the young people because they are the future and they have a little more mentality than the older people because the adults all the way on up have never been to school. Their mind is not a bit um, intelligent. Plus they're on opium so they can't think. And uh, they don't really try to think. But the children, they have a chance. So we also work for the children and try to reach the children. Now, I'm going to tell you a story that happened three weeks ago, um, almost four weeks ago. In early June, there was a dreadful storm that hit Thailand. And in our jungle mountains, it was extremely severe. In fact, rainy season is supposed to start gradually. But it just started with a bang in our villages up there. And torrential rain for two weeks that did not stop. And quickly, mountainsides were sliding down, trees were covering the road. It made transportation impossible. And our truck is at our house, and we're trying, it's tricky, because we're trying to figure out what part of the rainy season can we use the truck, and then at the last possible moment, we'll drive it out so we have it later when we can get out and we can use the truck. But now, we can't go anywhere. The trees are everywhere. The roads are demolished. You can hardly even walk somewhere because of the destruction of the ground. Well, <clears throat> in the middle of all this, in my village, we have to cross the river three times because the river does this. So we cross it here, we cross it here, we cross it here. Well, the first two crossings, we have to go right through the river into it. And the last one is a nice cement bridge. But now we've got two crossings. And so we know it's going to be a long time before we can get the truck out of there because the truck doesn't have a snorkel. We don't want a snorkel, but it doesn't have one. Well, at this very time when we're kind of socked into our house and we don't want to go anywhere, somebody comes to our house on foot. And they say, can you please come to our village? Somebody fell down and they're in great pain. Okay. 
Well, can we take the motorbike? No, you cannot take the motorbike. Okay, well, we'll come. We'll be there. So we got our clothes on and we started walking. Well, you know, it's dangerous in the truck. It's dangerous on the motorbike and it's dangerous on foot. And so we start walking. Well, this right here where I'm walking, this is the road. I'm right on top of the road. But the problem is that half the mountain is there also. Coming down, so we need to cross, we need to get around these landslides, and this one for me especially was quite difficult. You can laugh because I sure did. Now the problem with this is we've got to go back, you know, when we're finished. But we keep walking. This is just part of it. Sometimes we have to go through the jungle. You have to climb all the way up above the slide so that you can um, have some, somewhere to put your feet. And so on we go. It takes really a long time to get through this village, but finally we get there. And here's the little lady. Now this lady is in extreme pain. And when I first cast my eyes upon her, I knew what her problem was. She has a fractured hip. Do you see the left leg? This leg right here. It is shorter than the right one and it's rotated outward. So when you see that, there's a fracture here and she has fallen on the wet cement hard and she's not really a light lady she's a little heavy so she has broken her leg and look at her face she is in a lot of pain now i feel really sorry for this lady because how can we move her how can we do anything to help her it's not an emergency to fix a fractured hip it could be but it can wait however she is in so much pain and we want to get her help. Well, there's a truck in that village, but they can't go the way the trucks are supposed to go because of their trees. In my village, three villages had gotten together and cleared those big fallen trees away so that we can get through, but they need to get her to my village. And you see the problem I had walking. They're better than me, but they've got to carry somebody very heavy. But they said to us, if we can get her to Biota, will you take her to the hospital? And so we had to say, we'll do our best. We'll try. We'll go if we possibly can. But we're thinking, what about that river? It's really rushing. It's really high. But the trees have been cleared. But the rain is still coming down. So we go home. <laughs> I'll just show you this for amusement. why it's really hard for me. And Bledjo kind of embarrassed me because he wrote on his phone, about the, he took these pictures, bless his heart, and he wrote on his phone, searching for pearls. <laughs> so embarrassing. Anyway, we got home. We got home without any incident. And two hours later, here they come. They have the lady on a bamboo um, hooked to a blanket. She's still in a lot of pain. But they get this pole with her on it, and they stick the pole straight through the truck so she could be sitting uh, a little more easily in the back seat of that truck. Here's one of the guys with the, that was carrying her. Now. Just the day before, if you can see, this is going to be kind of dark, but if you can see at all, this is how high the water was, and I'll show you where the truck has to go just the day before. That's where we cross, right there.
trees are coming down through the water. This is how the, the river looks in dry season. But you know, without a snorkel and without any experience, we drive through that water to help this lady. And this is Blood Jaw, and you said your wife needs a Medal of Honor. What did you call it? Congressional, Congressional Medal of Honor goes to Blood Jaw also, as well as her, because he has become a very courageous driver in the Lord, and yet careful and planning his moves and praying all the way. And when we can't get somewhere, the Lord can get us there. And so we're in love with him and we're in love with this truck because angels are pushing and guarding this truck all the way. It's very special to us. And we got the lady to the hospital that day. She's had her hip surgery and she'll be coming home soon. If we make no effort to win souls to Christ, we shall be held responsible for the work we might have done but did not do because of our spiritual indolence. Those who belong to the Lord's kingdom must work earnestly for the saving of souls. This doesn't mean if it's just a bad day and you're too tired, there is no excuse. These are souls. Your life on this earth isn't nowhere near as important as your life and their life for eternity. It doesn't matter when we get to heaven. Uh, heaven will be cheap enough if we get there through suffering. Not one in a hundred of us is doing anything be beyond engaging in common worldly enterprises. We are not half awake to the worth of the souls for whom Christ died. Now, if you live in Thailand, like I do, and Jonathan does, and others, you are familiar with the news in Thailand. In fact, this news is all over the world, but I happen to be totally interested in it because the day it started, I was involved praying for this situation. Here are 12 young men, young boys. They're from uh, a soccer team. Here's the coach here. And there's 12 young, wait, 11 boys and a coach. And here they are before they entered into a cave. Every year, the coach will take a group of the soccer players, a team, to the cave and to explore and to understand things about the cave. So they went in on June 23 into this cave in Chiang Rai, which is northern part of Thailand. And after they entered that cave, unbeknownst to them, there was a heavy rainstorm. And because of the storm, water rushed in that cave, filling up the openings and cavities through that cave so that they could not get back out. And one day went by, two, three, four. In fact, 18 days went by. And we thought all hope would be gone. So in the process, the whole world came together to find these poor boys suffering in the depth of this cave. And they brought in people from all parts of the earth. There were hundreds of experts that came in to help rescue the 11 boys and their coach. And uh, of those experts, people came from England, from Australia, from Denmark, from America, and Germany. And with them came millions of dollars of equipment, and they went to work to try to rescue these boys. You can imagine the expense and the travel and the work. Everybody went all out to find these dear boys, young boys, and the parents were passing out with fear at the entrance of the cave. Uh, 18 days they were trapped in that cave and then the team, some of the team, found the boys safe and all alive on a sandbar where they could not move from because of all the water. Now, with the equipment that was used, here they are after they were found. Weak and cold, but the coach had done a real heroic thing to keep those boys alive, to conserve their energy, to drink the water out of the cracks of the rock. It gets purified when it comes to the rock, and not to drink the water that's coming in, which would kill them, and keep them calm. And they had one lunch, but that was 18 days. Hundreds of experts from the whole world risked their lives to save 
these, this group of people. There were 2,000 soldiers that came, engineers, paramedics, and volunteers. And finally, after they found those boys, here's the family, here's the friends, here are all the people rejoicing that they found these boys. But the hardest part was to get them back out because the boys didn't know how to swim. They were from 11 years old to 16 years old. And they needed to get them um, scuba diving gear and oxygen tanks and masks to get them up and teach them how to, to manage. Some came out on stretchers and two um, Navy SEALs had to go with each, with each boy. So it was a huge deal. They had to then, once they were evacuated, they went straight to the hospital. And here the hospital team is talking to the family. They have to be quarantined. They could have had histoplasmosis from the bats that can uh, spread a dangerous disease. But all the boys survived. Here they are in recovery. They wanted to eat the richest foods and everything, but they only got uh, the light foods to help their, their system come back in. And uh, here is the Thai rescue workers, Navy SEAL workers. Here is one Navy SEAL officer that lost his life. He sacrificed his life to save these boys. He was bringing in oxygen equipment, and as he was helping the other people, his oxygen supply ran out and he lost his life. He is a hero. The people recognize him. His picture is all over Thailand and uh, all in the newspapers that he uh, gave his life to save these boys. Now, something in Christian service rings a bell with me. A great work is to be accomplished. A voice must go forth to arouse the nations. Men whose faith is weak and wavering are not the ones to carry forward the work at this important crisis, not the crisis of the cave, something much, much more of a crisis. We need the courage of heroes and the faith of martyrs. Does it bring tears to your eyes? Do you want that courage? Do you want that faith? Do you want to be a hero? Be a hero for God, because the souls you save for heaven are worth way more praise and honor from Jesus than souls saved on this earth. Why do we go to such extremes to save a life on this earth when we're not willing to save a life for heaven? Not that that is wrong. It is right to save the life here on this earth. But when you compare it to eternity, no comparison. Well, one day, one day uh, we came in contact with a very sick man at the school at uh, Sunshine Orchard. And nobody happened to be around at the time to take care of him, so we went, Bledjo and I went to him to try to help him feel better. He had a very high fever. It was over 105, and so we give him tepid baths, and we try to bring the fever down, and his complaint, he's so weak. He can't, it's just weak. It's not pain, but it, weakness can become agony, I think, because he was in agony with weakness. We wanted to take him to the hospital, because I don't know what's wrong with him. And I'm not in my clinic, so I'm not sure, you know, how, what to do for him, but we watch him give him IVs and baths to bring his fever down, and in the night he got worse. He refused to go to the hospital. He would not go. And uh, so we keep trying, but in the night he got diarrhea and vomiting severely, and then he agreed to go. So we took him to the hospital, the smaller one, the first one, and he was admitted right away. And then we, we did what we could for the wife, and then we had to go back to Biota. So we go back to our village, and we're working away. Well, in uh, two, two or three days, we decide, you know, I want to go visit that man because I want to encourage him. He was so sick. Let's, let's just go to that hospital and visit him. Well, on the way out, we find out this man died that night. This man was taken to the bigger hospital in um, just hours. He hemorrhaged and blood under the skin, Trajoko, you know, and a horrible situation. Everything shut down and he died. And we felt so sad. And then we found out it's real important that you take medication because this disease is highly contagious. And people in Burma are dropping dead like flies. It's called uh, meningococcal septicemia. And it's like spinal meningitis, but instead of getting in the spinal cord, it's bacteria in the blood that multiply 
outrageously quickly and kill you very quickly. So we are threatened. I forgot this one. I guess our lives are threatened here too. And we're late to get the medicine, and yet we are, we are too busy to die. We have a huge plan that we've already promised and ready to execute the next, that very day. But we're going to be one day late. But coming out was a blessing because we got the medication. We took it. And with a prayer, we went back to our job. Here's the funeral of this dear man, well-loved man, his wife and two children. And off we go to Medeligui village. Medeligui village has 13 huts in it. It's a very dirty village. It's very far away. So we don't get there that often, but we want to spend a whole week with these people. And we have five plan, five goals. One is that we are going to clean their village and help them be clean. Number two is we're going to treat sick. Number three is we're going to give them one good meal every evening. Number four is we're going to teach them about health. And number five is the best, we're going to teach them about God. And so we start. We go, we're really excited. Now this village, as I said, is very dirty, but there was a big house right here that is empty. Somebody died in that house and nobody really wants to live there since that death. And it's quite large. It'd be a perfect place for us to work out of because we're going to have uh, treat the whole village uh, to their meals and to the worship and to the health talks. And we want everybody to be able to fit inside this house so it worked perfectly. The people helped us to clean the house. It hadn't been lived in for quite some time. So the floor was cleaned down. We even have it complete with a toilet, a bathroom, but it's not very private. It seems like that bamboo wall has, or leaf wall has disappeared a long time ago. And actually the toilet is backwards, so if you're tall, you can't hardly use that thing. But it's okay for me. <laughs> the people help us move in, help us carry in. We carry in all the food, all the supplies. We have gifts to give to the people, and everybody's real curious. We don't know these people much. We've been there a couple of times before, but here's all the food. We have a lot of food, hoping it's not going bad. And here's Jerry. He calls himself Jerry. This is Bledjaw's brother-in-law. He is a great asset. He's a good cook. And so he's our cook. And to have three of us is real important to help us with the music and to help us with the cooking. And, and so we assist him with the food. He's planning the food every night. We're excited. First thing we do is bond with the children. And that's not a hard thing to do. That is delightful. Many children in every village. And Bledja singing to the children. We light the candles every night so that we can see each other as we do our worships at night. We mingle with the people in the village. We, we look at their projects and their crafts and, and their livelihood. She's knitting a, a fish, fishing net. He's making bamboo strips because they're getting ready to plant rice and they will tie the rice, uh, the um, seeds in bags. Here's what the people are eating for their dinner. You can see there's a, a baby chicken here and there's two rats here. These rats will be cooked thoroughly and eaten for supper as a delicacy. Here's the rat getting cooked. We have a lady that is um, pounding the rice. She's going to be cooking all our rice. We will have our curry, but she would do the rice. 45 minutes this has to go on to get all the hulls off the rice. with the people, household by household, they have to help us. And we go out there and we sweep under the houses because there's, there's pig dung under there, chicken dung, cow dung, and whatever else, goat, whatever else happens to be wandering around. So we clean and we clean and we clean, it's dusty and we work. And you know, the pigs, there are so many pigs and these pigs have fleas. And so as you're cleaning under the house with the pigs, we are getting bitten by those pig fleas. Really nasty. It's worse than mosquito bites. So many pigs. 
filthy things. And then after we'd been there a couple of days, we got warned about this guy because he's not quite right in his mind. And uh, though he's really sweet, I just love him. They tell us that, you know, sometimes he just loses it. He'll take everything out of your house and burn it. So you need to watch out for him. And then we find out later, this girl, she seemed to really like me and love me, and she followed me everywhere. And they told me later, she's the village thief. She likes to steal and take anything she can find from uh, the people, especially visitors. Now we have our gifts to give, and the people are all excited. All 13 households appear for suppers, of course, and then for their free gift. Early on in the week, we brought these gifts because it was a wash basin to take baths in, to wash the children, to wash the clothes, and in there is laundry soap, bar soap, shampoo, toothbrushes, toothpaste, and dippers to take the bath, everything they need to be clean. And the people receive their gifts, they're delighted. They have uh, some new things, and they're going to use it. The very next day, I see clothes hung up to dry. I see children taking baths. And uh, they come to worship that night all clean, and with their, uh, they put the, the clay on their faces. They're beautiful, smell really good. And then they're hosing down to try to keep their, their place under the house clean, like we just cleaned it. Now we had a plan. Our plan, and we told all the people, Sabbath is the day we need to worship God. And we'd already done simple worships with them every night, followed by a health talk. And we told them, introduced Jesus to the people. And we told them how good he is, how loving and kind, how he came from heaven to live with us, to show us how to live. We want to tell you how he lived so we can live that way too. And so church, I had done a simple sermon to carry on from, from what I had taught those people. So we told them, uh, on Sabbath, whoever wants to can get in our truck. We'll take them to Biota and we'll have a sermon. And uh, we, then we'll bring you back. So we have a plan for Sabbath. So Sabbath morning, we get up and we're going to eat breakfast at the ladies' house. It does our rice and we have our curry. And as I'm opening my mouth to take the first bite of my breakfast, they begin to slaughter this pig. And the way they slaughter this pig is horrible. And the noise is horrible horrible and deafening and it's right outside our place right there where we're trying to eat our breakfast and so I didn't eat a thing that morning and come to find out they're gonna have a big celebration that day they're gonna have a party and somebody has already brought in the alcohol and the people are already starting to drink it and now this pig is getting prepared for the party some of it's gonna be cooked but most of it's getting chop 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 like I told you yesterday and they eat it raw and it's Sabbath, no less. And nobody gets in our truck to come to Biota to hear about God. And so we're disappointed and we're sad and we, we get in our truck and we go by ourselves because we need to, to take care of the sermon. And then after that, we come back. And we've got until Tuesday and we keep working with the people. The pe people keep coming to worship and they love to hear us sing. We sing in English and we sing in Koran and uh, they listen. And when we talk about God because they never heard about it, oh, they're so intent. They're listening so carefully to every word. So we are delighted. We are just filled to overflowing. And uh, then it comes the last day, Tuesday. And on that day, the people are going to go to their rice fields. And on the, on the uh, slopes, it's mountain rice on the steep slopes. They cut all the trees down and then time goes by and it gets dry and then they need to light a fire and burn it all up so then they can plant their rice. But before they burn it, they have to build a firewall around it, a wide path through the jungle so the fire doesn't go wild through the jungle. It's not like America because they can contain the flames. So that day, the government had said that uh, the next day was the day they had to burn because when they start burning, the whole air is filled with smoke and you can hardly breathe. So if they get it all done at one time, we might get through with the smoke early, but it never works that way. We breathe smoke for two months. Anyway, we're gonna, they asked us, are you gonna come and help us? And so we talked about that. We weren't really prepared. I just had my little flip-flops on and a skirt. And, but we said, you know, we come to win these people to God, so we need to join them in their work. So we decided we go with you. 
they were delighted. So as we start out, they look at me and they're really scared because I'm really old. And they look at me and they, they say, she shouldn't come, she shouldn't come. And they look at Bledra, he, he said, don't worry, she can do it. Because after even 40, um, and especially 50, the people don't go anywhere and they don't do any work because they don't know how to live healthy like me. And they don't have the right food or anything, so they cannot go. So I went with them that day. And I don't have any problem going up the mountain, but I do have a problem going down. But that day, we go up. We don't have to bring it's tools and hose because once we get up there, we cut a branch, a tree branch off, and we clear the, um, that great big section with our um, branches. And so everybody has a branch. A few people have hose. The men go ahead. Here we are walking. We got lost. The people didn't even know the right way. We had to change. And so here we are at the place where we're clearing, and it goes fast because there's a lot of people. The guys are up front with machetes, cutting the big weeds, and then we're, we're sweeping all the loose stuff off the trail. Really steep, but really fun. And it seems like you can just see the path forming before your eyes as everybody's sweeping, sweeping, sweeping. And we rest along the way, and people are scratching, scratching, scratching. There's all kinds of those fleas and mites and things that bite you. We weren't without mishaps because Ledjaw cut his finger. Uh, there's a really sharp uh, stem to a weed that he'd gotten a hold of and cut his finger. So this jungle medic here got the weed that stops bleeding. He squished it up, wrapped it around his finger. A woman got her machete, cut off the bottom of her her shirt and tied it around that finger and he was ready to go and he kept working. Well, I was doing fine until we came to this. What do you call this thing? This is uh, it's very straighter than straight down. Yeah. Escarpment, do you call it? I looked at that and I thought, no way. I don't think I can go down there. And people are hopping down, hopping down. It's my turn. And so, you know, I got down that steepest part but it's all loose because it's already been swept and cut and, and the, it's cut so low there's no tree trunk or something to put your foot on and I fall and I go scooting down on my bottom really fast down part of that, that uh, escarpment and the people, they're so sweet. They don't laugh at you. They don't think it's funny. They feel sorry for you and try to help you. And uh, then when we got to the bottom, we put a bamboo in the little stream there and we drink the water and the neatest thing is then they cut uh, banana leaves and lay them down in the road and they pull out the um, boiled rice that they have in their bags and we sit down and we eat rice and chili on the mats together with the villagers from Medlegui village. Is it not neat? It's so wonderful. And then we had to hurry home. We couldn't go to the next garden and help over there because now we need to cook. Five o'clock, we've got to eat. The people will be coming in. They're going to be really hungry. So we go, let y'all with this, I bandage his hand, clean it really well, and we cook. And this is our last night with the people of Medlicui Village. And we cook our best meal. And I prepare my worship for that night. We serve the people the food. They love the food. We have our worship together. It was the most appealing sermon because I said, uh, think of the person that, uh, think about the person that you hate the most. Now, first of all, think of the person you love the most. Would you be willing to die for that person? And they go, uh uh. Then think of the person you hate the most. Really hate, and they're going, like, yeah, I really do. And would you die for that person? And then I told them about Jesus. And it was just the atmosphere of heaven. You know, heaven is closer to the worker for God than many should suppose, Mrs. White says. And then after worship, we did the health talk about taking care of your teeth and not chewing betel nut. And then we gave everybody a t-shirt. And we had the most lovely time together. And when we finished, everybody's waving and saying goodbye to us. And we still have a very close unity with those people. And I pray that they can be saved in heaven. Because Mrs. White says even a smile to a teenager can be the means of salvation. So when you devote a week, maybe that's even more people saved. Let's hope. Now, I'm not going to show you all this. This is... Um, Graduation, we help to send the young people to school because in Chiang Mai is Adventist Academy and uh, they do a really good job. It's kind of late. I don't know why I'm showing you this. 
they make a real big deal. The graduates are in the center, and the people are singing around con uh, some congratulatory song in Thai, and then um, they bow, and then this is the young man we put through school there. He's finished graduating from Chiang Mai Adventist Academy, and he's very grateful, very sweet. And he's had some problems in school, but I think he's overcoming them. We want to help the, the young people. We're sending some to school in Burma and two to college. This quote, just burn it with fire in your mind and in your heart. If we are not willing to make special sacrifices in order to save souls that are ready to perish, how can we be counted worthy to enter into the city of God. We're serious, we're Seventh-day Adventists, we've been it all our life, most of us, and yet could it be we're not ready to enter into the city of God? Surely not. Mrs. White says, I'm ashamed to say it. I'm ashamed to write it. And so the sacrifices must be made, and in the sacrifices, it's not a sacrifice when you get involved doing this. It is so wonderful. Now, there are, I'm not telling you, there's no discouraging moments because we can really get oppressed by the enemy and also thinking, what good is this doing? Um, and we have preached, we have taught, we have uh, preached almost every Sabbath. We do worships, we go to people's homes, we pray with the patients that come in our clinic and uh, in different villages. We do Bible studies, we do baptismal classes. Here's patients that come that are being told about the seven-day Sabbath and what God tells us to do. They listen attentively, but we, you know, years are going by, we don't really see any, any big change. We're doing worships. The people are interested, they're really listening, but they're simple people. What, how can they understand? God can take that into account and save them long before we can imagine. Look at the people looking, look how interested. Also, the Koran Bible is not understood well by them because it's written on the Burma side with a different accent and Burmese words. Up there, they use Thai words mixed in with their Koran in a different accent or different tones. So it's hard. These people we've studied with a long time, this little family will get baptized. So there is rewards. Here's worship groups, different worship groups in different places. Christ rejoiced that he could do more for his followers than they could ask or think. He knew that the life of his trusting disciples would be like his, a series of uninterrupted victories, not seen to be such here, but recognized as such in the great hereafter. And that's all that counts. Work in faith and leave the results with God. <coughs> Pray in faith and the mystery of his providence will bring its answer. At times it may seem that you cannot succeed, Yes, but work and believe, putting into your efforts faith, hope, and courage. After doing what you can do, wait for the Lord to, to declare and declare his faithfulness, and he will bring his word to pass. Wait not in fretful anxiety, but in undaunted faith and unshaken trust. Do you like those last words? What a combination of words. Mrs. White can just really express it. Now, last year, Jesus for Asia, John and Natalie, found uh, audio Bibles in the Skal Karen language, 40 of them. People donated and they were sent to me. I had 40 Skal Karen. When I came back from America last year, AWR had 60 ready for me with extra things like Bible studies and um, sermons and steps, the book Steps to Christ in the Skal Karen language. Uh, AWR was going to do that two years ago, but I'd forgotten about it because it'd been so long I thought it wasn't going to happen. But now suddenly I have a hundred audio Bibles and we start giving them out because we have preached about the Bible and how powerful it is in our lives, how we need it. And the only way that people got it was through our talking to them. Now they have audio Bibles. We went to another village, talked about them, gave away three. This lady, look how happy they are. They have three. The next day, nine people came from that village asking for the Bible. Can we have the Bible? And it went out. It went out all over like the leaves of autumn to the people in all the villages around me. All hundred are given away. This lady came to me with her pipe and her tobacco, and she traded her tobacco and her smoking habit for an audio Bible. Is that not the best trade in the world? And then here she is, smiling with her audio Bible. I pray she's still not smoking. Well, two years ago, I, I met Jimmy, Pastor Jimmy Shui. He's a Koran pastor that has worked all up and down the border 
of Thailand, Burma, and in Burma, and even knew my area. And I, I just providentially got to meet him a year ago. And uh, in meeting with him, I become quite excited because I've been thinking about evangelism for a long time. And uh, in talking to him, he's quite enthusiastic and speaks Quran and uh, knows the area. And so I mention it. He says, I'll do it. I'll do evangelism in your village. I can come the end of November. This is last November. And so I'm like, yes, OK. But in my heart, I'm thinking, I, I don't know if this really is going to happen or not. So I'm praying and uh, planning for the end of November evangelism. Well, I don't know the exact date, but John Wood comes to Thailand. He's got a special project going on. And his project is to make a media truck. If you were here yesterday, you saw that. He is going to make a media truck, four-wheel drive truck, and re renovate the whole back of it to be a mobile media production vehicle that can drive to other places, record the whole sermon or evangelism or whatever, health talks, whatever, and then the people can have it and other villages that can't be reached can be able to watch uh, or listen to the, the uh, and watch it. And so it's a great big accomplishment. And that time that he visited, they finished it. And I heard about this, that he finished that media truck. And I am so happy for them. I've been praying about that. And so I noticed he's trying to get a hold of me, but I don't have phone service, I don't have internet, and I don't have electricity, and I don't have shops. And I climbed the mountain to make a phone call. So I decided I'm going to climb the mountain. I'm going to call John Wood. And I'm going to congratulate him and just have my part in there. And as I'm climbing the mountain, I think, you know, I'm going to tease him. I'm just going to joke a little bit. And I'm going to tell him that he's got that truck finished just in time to record evangelism in Biota. But it was a big joke because I knew that would be totally impossible. They wouldn't do that way up in my jungle mountain. So I climbed the mountain. And I talked to John Wood, and I said my funny thing. And his response was quick and immediate and serious. He says, that's exactly what we plan to do. I'm just trying to get a hold of you to get your permission. <laughs> I sit down in the jungle. And my mouth is open, and I cry because he's going to come with a media truck to my village and record evangelism. And it's good because in my mind, I'm kind of doubting. This evangelism program is going to be morning and night for, uh, for one week, ending on Sabbath, a nice Sabbath program. And I'm thinking, my people aren't going to come morning and night for one week. I'd be lucky if I get four people, even to come to all those meetings, but we're talking it up and we're visiting the villages and we're inviting the people and we're telling them all about it. And we, um, before it starts, that media truck comes. It parks outside of our church and it has five media producers with it. And Jonathan Hill is one of them here today. I don't think anybody else is here. We invited the other missionaries to our village. And that media truck immediately set up. My solar system was able to handle that media truck. God was just working everything out in his sweet way, in his smooth way. And it says, be anxious for nothing, right? We really have no need to be anxious for anything. And I want to show you a video that Jonathan Hill uh, put together on this media truck. We were thinking, oh man, it'd be so much better to have a 4x4 truck that we could have all our gear in, roll up to any site, anywhere, pull out the cameras, the gear, and then record. It seemed like a pipe dream. It seemed like, it seemed like too much. And then along comes this year. Actually, it only dawned on me this week that that was the dream we had had four years ago. It's really amazing how God brings things about. I cannot tell you how excited I was to hear that the media team with this new truck would actually come to my village. There's so much potential with what we're able to do now. 
I just pray that hearts will be changed and that many, many of the people here and everywhere that that needed truck goes can be in heaven because of it. It's a great work. Thank you, Jonathan. And so it happened, folks. And my little church had three big cameras in it, almost filling the whole place up. And not only that, but uh, Pastor Jimmy had invited this couple, Leonardo and Vanessa. Um, Vanessa. Uh, had invited them to come, and he would be doing the, the evangelism, and Pastor Jimmy would be translating. As soon as we went to Mesa and picked this couple up from the airport, we fell in love with them. What a godly couple. How thrilled they were to be there. They have a church in Illinois, and um, there's a Koran church, an English church that he pastors, and he wanted, they both of them wanted to see the Koran people themselves in their real setting in Thailand or Burma. So they came. They were so encouraging. They were so uh, blessed. And he preached every morning and every night in our little church. Not four people came, not five people came, not 10 people came, but 50 people or more. Every night and every morning. And here's the stacks that came. And Brenda Stegg brought her piano, the first time our church ever saw a piano. She played, and uh, they sang special music. It's just like the angels singing, I wish I had, had that live. And here is Pastor Leonardo simply telling them about the love of Jesus, to get them in love with Jesus, and to be, be, help them know how to prepare for Jesus coming night after night and the media team was there recording every single word and every single action during the whole week morning and night it was the most exciting thing and then pastor Jimmy was also meeting with all the people he was talking to them finding out where they stood in their knowledge of Jesus and in their desire and so as he was working with the people not just two people that we knew were ready for baptism, but 16 people are ready for baptism. And that day that I'll never forget, the people crowded around the river spot, and 16 people were baptized, and here they are. And I have so much more to tell you, but it's enough. And I want to end with a really special video. I don't know if I can bear to watch it again, but I will. And this video, I think Jonathan just finished yesterday and said I could put it in at the end of my program. So I won't be able to talk much afterwards. I will pray, but I want you to tell you something before I'm finished. Please pray for my people in the mountains. They are slow, they are ignorant, but they have just as much right to the kingdom as anybody else, young and old. I really appreciate it. And I will never forget you. I thank you so much. So yesterday was a high Sabbath. Um, that was the day we were to have a baptism for the second time in eight years here at the river. We had worked with several people very closely preparing them for baptism and we knew of a few that were ready but when Pastor Jimmy came and with his personality and his zeal visiting villages talking to people and uh, doing services here there were many people really interested in joining our church. And uh, because we've been here for eight years preaching uh, on Sabbaths, doing worships and uh, praying with the people, they know quite a bit, the people right around here that come to church, know quite a bit about the Bible. And there were 16 precious souls that uh, wanted to be baptized. So Sabbath after church, we all came down to this river. They were all baptized right here. I sat right here on the bank and I took pictures of everyone, but I just had to cry tears of joy because 
it means so much. We have been through so much darkness here and the people receive the light so slowly. It almost is imperceptible. I just want to encourage all of you and just uh, be part of God's work because it's so, some experience you can uh, describe it. You got, you just feel good inside. Nobody else can feel that because of you helping other people, even though not much, a little bit, but you just feel good inside. So I just wanted to have that experience here and forever also. We have no idea the future, how much more uh, the Lord will do for us here in this place. It's, it's overwhelming and my heart is so full of joy. It's just running over all over the place. Dear Lord in heaven, I just pray that their blood will not be on our shoulders. I pray that we will be found faithful, like with the courage of heroes and the faith of martyrs, that we will be found in our lot at the end of the days, doing the work that you've marked out for each one of us. It's a different job for each one, Lord but it's a special one that only that person can do, only you, only me. And it is so joyful, wonderful job, Lord. We are so privileged to carry your banner and to walk the bloodstained pathway, to follow where your footsteps have led out. May we have the courage, Lord, to do whatever it takes to spend and be spent for you. And I just pray that anybody that can hear this message or uh, within the sound of this voice can be determined in their own heart to be ready for having themselves giving all and to help others with all their might, with all their heart, with all their strength. And as we do it to others, Lord, we're doing it to you. So I thank you so much and praise you and give you all the honor for everything we know we don't have to worry for the future except we forget how you led us in the past. And we could never forget that, Lord. So we thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.